Thanks very much, Tanner. And uh, greetings from the nation's capital, Ottawa, here. I know that uh, I followed up uh, Andy Sparks, already another good Ottawa guy, but appreciate that. Um, and as well, uh, just uh, honored and thrilled to uh, be asked to uh, to speak at this. Uh, you know, plenty of uh, some unbelievable guests and uh, again, honored to, to share kind of what I've been through and uh, again, excited and uh, Thanks for the opportunity to basketball immersion, uh, Coach Oliver. And uh, as I said, uh, very excited uh, talking about, uh, again, building a prep champ and championship culture. Um, culture, uh, as we know, um, you know, as I said, uh, it's, it's everything. I mean, anything you do, I've had, uh, you know, a lot of experience in, in not only sports, but in the private sector. Anything that, uh, you know, is, is a group always has a culture. So um, obviously you developed this PowerPoint and here are some of the topics that we're gonna touch on. Uh, what is culture and its characteristics, of course. Who champions culture? Uh, foundations, of course, I'll speak to my experience with CTA culture and look at vision, mission and values. Um, lead by example, uh, we are a family. Our CTA core culture, dress for the job you want. Uh, the uber competitive practice environment, which is important. Uh, of course, recruiting, you got to do your homework in all facets, player contract, sign and abide, goal setting, distractions to a championship culture. Um, I know there was this little documentary, Last Dance. I'm not sure if anybody's <laughs> seen that, but I want to talk about that and the, the narrative that that kind of created uh, throughout the basketball landscape and, of course, the conclusion. Uh, but that's what we're going to touch on today. So what is culture and its characteristics? Well, culture is simply, you know, the way of life of groups of people, meaning the way you do things or they do things, uh, who we are and what we do and what we believe in. So if you think about it uh, in those terms, it's, it's really pretty much everything. Um, I've had the experience, as I said, in sports and in business, uh, culture is everywhere. Um, it's in organizations, it's in teams. Um, it's, it's basically, you know, uh, it could be a championship culture, but on the downside, it could also be toxic and negative. So uh, it's one of those things that uh, you really have to sort of cultivate and champion and, uh, and really try to maintain that. The good thing about culture, it's learned. It's not, uh, it's not inherited. It's not biological. Um, you know, I've had the, 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 the severe, you know, the fortunate uh, part of having uh, an unbelievable uh, role model in parents. Um, when you go to have a culture, it kind of starts with actually your own family and role models for me. Um, obviously, my, my mom, she's salt of the earth woman, but my late father who passed away in June, um, he was a very successful uh, athlete, coach, uh, judge, lawyer. He was very successful in everything he did. And he was my mentor and my role model. And, uh, you know, he's definitely a guy that I miss. But, um, you know, parents are your role models. Obviously, you know, I played for a lot of great coaches. Uh, I've, uh, I've been able to kind of, uh, you know, be empowered by them and, 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 and basically learned a lot of, you know, again, some very successful teams. I had a fortunate to, to win quite a few championships as a player. But I've also had been on a, you know, some, some losing teams. So you get to see kind of what works and what doesn't. But the good thing is, is, you know, culture is learned. A culture is also shared. Uh, it can be shared uh, with other members of groups. Um, that's what, uh, again, the buy-in. Uh, but definitely it's something that can be shared and, uh, and, and built uh, within groups. And, and it has to be. Um, you have to share it. You have to create that buy-in uh, from the players, and uh, it's really important. But uh, definitely culture is shared. It's integrated. Um, the various parts of the culture being interconnected. All aspects of a culture are related to one another. And that to truly understand a culture, one must learn about all of its parts, not only a few. And, of course, the last thing is culture is dynamic. It means that it can change. Uh, most cultures, you know, are, are in contact with other cultures. So the people that you recruit from your coaching staff to your trainer, and we'll talk in depth about, you know, recruiting the types of players. Um, everybody comes from a, of a different environment. And it's one thing that you got to do is to try to mesh all these different beliefs into one culture that you're sort of trying to cultivate and share. So who creates culture? Again, uh, I thought this graphic was pretty powerful. You don't create culture with signs and slogans. You create culture with people and leadership. And 
at the end of the day, like, yeah, we don't, I, the signs and slogans, you're going to see a few here and there from my presentation, but this really is the bottom line is it's the people, it's the relationships. And of course it starts with uh, the top and the leadership. So, um, you know, starts with you. Uh, specifically about CTA leadership, as I was able to recruit a pretty good executive board uh, of like-minded people in our community, whether it was basketball and sports related, um, as well, Peggy Talon. So she sits on my board as the president of the Briere Foundation. Uh, she brings a different light on the, on the giving, volunteerism, uh, very philanthropic, but she's uh, a great lady. Uh, Dave Smart, I think a few people know know him out there. Uh, you know, he's 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 obviously got uh, a good championship culture at Carleton. A uh, good friend of mine, uh, Tanner mentioned the Routens House Basketball School. That's 30 plus years. Leo's basically like the big brother. Well, I never wanted, but uh, no, he's a guy that I can uh, you know obviously dwell on and 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 leverage his his great experience and his successes. And of course, Milt Palacio. Uh, who's the NBA, uh, ex-NBA guy, uh, an assistant coach. So, you know, we really have formed kind of the dream team leadership. And it all starts from them. And as I said, very like-minded and people that I can kind of, you know, they can mentor me. Um, again, they don't have to think the same. I don't think you want people that necessarily are just yes men or yes women. Uh, you want them to question the way you do things. You want them to, you know, you want to be accountable uh, as I am to, to them, as, as I am to my other coaches and as I am to my players, which we'll again get into. But it really all, all in essence, starts with the, the leadership group and it starts with the top. I think it's important too that and anything you do, it's important that I think you write it down. I think, uh, and then that you create, uh, you know, again, uh, something that it, always you have something to visit that uh, you you need to, to to keep you in check. That if things kind of you know fall out of place, that you always have something to kind of keep you you know on the course and keep you focused. So I think any organization, whether it's a prep school, whether it's a company, whether it's you know again any 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 team, I think you need to have vision. I don't want to go into uh, all this but this is again what CTA does is we just strive to be the premier basketball academy in the world we will develop elite basketball student athletes while supporting and guiding them as they achieve their ultimate goals in basketball academics and life you need to have a mission our mission is to help shape the next generation of leaders on and off the court and change the way our youth grow into adulthood we will provide the support and tools to ensure our student athletes develop academically emotionally and athletically we have set the academic and athletic standards and expectations to match those of all post-secondary institutions so that the transition to the next level is seamless. I think that's important uh, when we talk about, you know, kind of our core culture. As well, of course, you know, Canada Top Flight will create a family atmosphere that all of our stakeholders would be proud of. Our staff and students will represent the academy in a mature, responsible manner, realizing the impact that they will have and the role models they will become. Canada Top Flight Academy staff and student athletes will be known locally and nationally for their dedication to being the best they can be on and off the court. Our staff and student athletes will work and play at an elite level from the classroom to the weight room and on the court. The Canada Top Flight Academy family will hold each other to these highest standards. Canada Top Flight Academy believes in a healthy balance of school, training, work, family, and communication and the community. And then, of course, the program values. We will be character people, be kind to one another, pay it forward. Appreciate and respect the game and your community. Get after it like no other program. No one will outwork CTA. Improve in all areas of your life and off and on and off the court. Be the benchmark. Create elite student athletes. Represent yourself, your family, Canada Top Flight Academy, Notre Dame High School, and the Ottawa community in a professional manner at all times. So when you look at this, you know, again, you know, the vision, ability to think about our, your plan or plan for the future with imagination or wisdom. Uh, the mission, describing a company's function. It's a short written statement of your business goals and philosophies. And of course, the values, their principles or standards of behavior, uh, one's, a, one's judgment of what is important in life. So this kind of keeps us on the straight and narrow. Without this, uh, you really have nothing. You need to develop uh, what's the most important part, what you represent, what your 
you know, every stakeholder represents. It's what it really kind of holds you together. And I think no matter what business sports, the vision, mission, and values are a really important part to create a championship culture. So we uh, lead by example. So it really starts with the coaches. Well, we started with obviously our executive team. And then now we need to recruit uh, our coaching staff and training staff. And it's one that, you know, again, you know, as a coach, our behavior, our coaches, trainers, it, it basically is going to, uh, is going to, you know, cultivate the type of culture you want. So, um, you know, you, you got to, you know, live the code that you put in place by practicing what you preach on a daily basis. And, you know, the old adage, I would rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. So it really starts with you. And again, the kind of compete level that you want. Uh, my two coaching pet peeves, which really kind of, when I walk into a gym, I've been doing this quite a long time, is do you quit as a coach? I walk into a gym and I've seen really great coaches. I've seen young coaches that when you're up 20, everything's going great. Shots are falling. We're getting stops. You're up. You're engaged. You're, you know, you're coaching. But then I see coaches that in the same game, all of a sudden there's a game of runs basketball. So all of a sudden now, you know, the other team, they go on a, you know, a 10 point run, a 15 point run. And all of a sudden you're down 15. You might be down 20. Well, do you quit? Do you start sulking? How's your body language? You now, I'm, I'm a stander as a coach. So my team knows that, you know, I may not say a lot, but the fact that I'm up and, and I'm engaged, that's, that's the sign where, you know, you need to tell your, your team that they believe in you. But I've seen a lot of guys, girls coaching in this game that when all of a sudden the chips are down and you're losing, that they quit. That's the time when they need you to start coaching. So if you don't expect your guys to quit, or your team to quit, you can't quit. And I've seen this in countless a number of times, but again, it's one of my pet peeves. You don't want your team to quit, don't quit. Keep coaching and, and coach through all those, you know, the ups and downs, whether it's a game, tournament, a whole season, you can't quit on your guys. The other thing is, is it the ref's fault? You know, these are all culture, not culture killers, but these are all little signs that it starts from you. The players, the staff, they're all looking at you. You're the leader. And all of a sudden now, it's the ref's fault. Uh, and I see this a number of times where, yeah, you know what? Like everybody else, the refs are going to have a tough day at the office. You may think you're getting screwed. Um, all of a sudden now, they become the focus. And if you start calling out the refs, questioning every call, arguing every call, um, you, you know, the fact that you think you're getting screwed, well, guess what? Your players are going to think they're getting screwed and they're going to lose focus. And all of a sudden, you know, it's the ref's fault. These are kind of the, the two pet peeves. Do you quit or do you use excuses? Um, you know, in my day, I think I can count the number of technical fouls that I've had as a player and as a coach. It's never going to be the ref's fault. I assume and I tell my guys that the refs suck. OK, we don't call a lot in practice, so they're just going to assume that, you know, everything's not going to go their way. Um, but this is part of establishing your culture. And I really think that that's a, a big part of of what, you know, you can do to kind of instill just some little things that can help, again, get the culture of a winning culture or a championship culture. Be accountable. Make it make it make it on you. And as I said, don't quit. And, and don't ever, well, you can always blame the refs, but at the end of the day, they're never gonna change a call and just work through it and coach through all the, uh, all the ups and all the downs. Everybody talks about a family culture. I saw a great acronym. So forget about me, I love you. So this is a good chance that, again, you know, uh, you're thinking about someone in your family. Uh, as coaches, we're always striving to build the family-like culture by showing each and every one of your athletes and coaches that you truly care about them as individuals and not just about their sports. So this is all about, you know, having that nurturing type 
family type atmosphere that you know that you're going to want and 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 desire that you know it may not be you know it may not be always i mean you're always going to have some dysfunction in in, in any kind of family but you want to work through things and you really want to show your your student athletes and your team and everybody in your organization how much you care because your athletes you know they won't care about how much you know until they know how much you care and i think that's a big part of you know them buying in um at the end of the day uh, it's not about you know sometimes you walk into practice and it's not you know getting right into the drills it's walking around and and asking johnny how his day was how his parents are especially running a prep school uh, people running universities uh, there's out of town kids who you know for them it's a big time adjustment so how are they adjusting how school going uh, the more you can get to know each individual uh, i think it's uh, it lends itself to to, to again a, a very family type culture and the more you can do away from the game uh, as again a coach i have my out of town guys for dinner um, you know obviously i can drive them all over the place we do a whole bunch of things i just show them uh, how much we care and as far as again it's my, my whole staff and i think everybody's kind of in that same boat it's not about making them just a, a great basketball player but really working with them on people and showing that that they care now you can't treat them the same not everybody's the same. Uh, you just kind of have to treat them fairly. They're all wired different. Um, that's the one thing I've, I've kind of taken from this as far as over the course. I used to kind of treat every player sort of the same, but everybody's treated, uh, everybody's wired differently. You, everything that they're motivated by different things. The one thing you got to do is make sure that you, you know, you know the buttons that they press. Some people, you know, they can handle the kick in the ass. Some others, they need more hugs. Uh, those are the types of things that you need to do as a coach uh, or, or director of a company or whatever to know what motivates each each athlete because they're all different. But when I say fairly, uh, at the end of the day, you know, they all have to sign up to the standards, which we'll talk about and play by the rules. So, yes, you can create uh, treat them a little, you know, cre treat them the same. Uh, but when it comes to, again, uh, discipline, that's got to be all fairly. And at the end of the day, we talked about what builds culture. Well, it's relationships, it's people, and trust is everything. Without trust, no matter what relationship you're in, whether it's your, your wife, your boss, uh, you know, anything, you need to have trust. So, Based on our core culture, I say dress for the job you want, not, not the one that you have. Or play, play, for, play for the job that you want and not the one that you have. So what we like to do is, you know, we want to run it like a college program, not a high school. So there's a lot of coaches out there. I would suggest that if you're a grade seven, eight program, you want to run it like a junior high school program. If you're a junior high school program, you want to run it like a senior high school team. If you're a senior high school team, you want to run it like a college program. And that's what, that's what we do. We want to try to create a culture of the next level. Uh, we want to try to make sure that when the kids leave us, that they're ready and they can handle the challenges at the next level. So when we talk about the expectations and standards, you know, we, we definitely want to match, you know, those uh, that they're going to, you know, have not at, not at CTA, but again, we want to run and simulate a, a, a college type university environment. So when you're a prep school, that's what you do is you prep them. Uh, you prep them to make sure that they can be ready for that next level academically. We work on their study habits. From a personal standpoint, we would work at time management, uh, communication, decision making, and critical thinking. We want to work on leadership characteristics and get to try to get that out of them. And of course, you know their mental well-being and just generally being responsible. Yes, we have you know you can have anybody from you know grade nine to a post grad, so anyone from 14, 15 years of age to 18 or 19 years of age but we want to treat them like adults. Yes, they're minors for the most part, but we want to teach them responsibility because at the next level, 
you know, they're going to have to adapt. They're, you know, no one's chasing them to go to school. I mean, obviously there's to classes. They're going to get, you know, study hall in and tutoring and all that great stuff. But at the end of it, I think they want to, we want to make sure that they're just ready and prepped for that next level. And of course, athletically, you know, we, we approach, you know, we approach everything we do with that in the mind of a university. So when you schedule your games, when you practice, everything is going to be at a high intensity, and we'll talk about that. But athletically, you know, and and when we when I get the best, you know, we play in the MPA. There's the OSBA. Uh, we try to, you know, we want to play the best teams, and we've also tried to play uh, SAGEPs colleges you know, we're, we're beating them we're beating the majority of them but we want to get we want to get the most out of our players and if we just set up a, a cupcake type schedule where you're just beating everybody by 20 30 40 points that's not getting them ready for the you know for, for the next level we want to play older competition we want to play all the best teams and so they're ready to take on that challenge uh, from the get-go So, talked about the graphic. I really like this one. Uh, you can't practice soft and expect and expect to play hard. And at the end of the day, you know you need to create an uber competitive practice environment. If your practices aren't tough, uh, you know it's going to be really really hard to kind of cultivate and build a championship uh, environment or culture. Because don't forget, you know, like we play what, 30, 40 games, and we probably practice maybe 140 times in a year. So it's a three to one practice to game ratio. So you just can't expect players to kind of turn it on and off. And of course, you know, you play like you practice. And as I said, you know, culture is fostered and maintained in practice because of the frequency. So we want, we keep score, our practices, we keep score of everything. At any drill, everything that we do is a competition. And, you know, for every, for every drill, you know, there is a winner and a loser. And, of course, there's a reward and a punishment. And there's a kind of a development of, and a hatred for losing. So, guys, you know, if you lose a, one of the shooting drills, whether it's individual or team shooting drill, you know, everything is scored. And if there's a, there's a loser, they're doing, you know, pro sprints, 17s, push-ups, sit-ups, whatever it is. And, you know, the team, they get to talk shit. The winners get to talk shit. And the losers, they just got to do, do what they got to do. And But everything we do, um, even, uh, even our shooting ladder, every day there's, we have a shooting ladder that we take three, 400 shots a day. They're all, they're all accounted for. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a one versus one. And they get to challenge each other, and uh, they get to move up the, the 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 shooting ladder. And everything it's serious because if you're a top four, top five guy in our shooting chart, you actually you get rewarded and you get to shoot certain shots in a game. So everything everything we do has ramifications, and everything we do is is scored. And it's a it's like I said, it's a it's a contest. Um, high intensity and practices right? and that's that's always a tough one but between all of us as a coaching staff we want to make sure that the intensity is 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 very high in practice you know games they just become a practice with fans and coverage uh, the pressure the pressure is so great in practice the competitiveness is so great in practice that the games are just you know they're just kind of a cakewalk and again they just can't wait to beat up on opposing teams so it's really important and I know a lot of you know some coaches have talked about again the practice environment but when you talk about a game ratio of three to one four to one you know that you know a lot of your culture is established and maintained at the high level of intensity that you run in practice. So the big part too obviously is you know you know who's going to create or help kind of champion the culture so it's it's your management it's your coaching staff it's your trainers and then now 
we got to figure out um, who's going to be, you know, who's going to be that perfect recruit or potential prospect that will buy in. So at the end of it, of course, you know, everybody's going to be talented. You know, everybody's going to be talented. Um, you know, that that's, you know, they have to, they have to be able to compete at your level or higher because again, our standards are going to be that much higher. Um, we're going to go out and watch a recruit live, of course, as many times as we can. We're going to review full game film for all the intangibles. So, and we'll watch them, you know, countless times because again, these highlight videos that we get, you know, those are, those are great. That grabs our attention, but we, re what we really need is we want to watch him live and we obviously want to review full game film for the intangible. And one of the one things that I like to watch is I want to see him or her uh, on their worst day. And how are they doing? Are they, how is their body language? Are they quitting? Uh, are they still engaged? Uh, just because their shots aren't falling, um, what, what, how is their reaction? Um, are they blaming their teammates? Are they blaming the coach? Um, in timeouts, are they separated from the coach? Are they, are they engaged? Um, as I said, this is the kind of things that, you know, we've, we've talked about the vision, the mission, and the values, and the types of, you know, coaches that we recruit. Now we want to go out and try and find, you know, the other major piece of the puzzle is the, the athletes that are going to play for us. So, as I said, the talent, well, that, that's a given. Um, you know, they have to be you know, talented enough to, to, to not compromise your practices. And obviously, you know, again, I want to see them on a bad day and I want to see what they're, you know, how they're, you know, how they're, how that's affecting them. Um, but from an attitude, mental and physical um, characteristics. The other thing is the next steps is obviously, again, trying to build that rapport, trying to build as much, uh, you know, intel on the on the on the player so again having a player parent meeting um i'm i'm all i i like to you know ask questions i like to you know listen more than i like to talk um so and again a player parent meeting how does he actually how does he treat his parents how does he talk about his current team and coach that speaks volumes to to again the type of uh you know culture that, that that we want the respect that he has for not only his parents but is he talking you know is he talking down about you know the the, the, the past coach his past programs um, those are all flags for what I consider an, a student athlete that we're trying to to recruit and bring to CTA obviously you know high high moral character no maintenance student athletes obviously that's 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 huge I mean we look at, again, the, the moral character. We look at uh, things like courage, fortitude, honesty, loyalty, you know, their behavior. Is it good behavior? Do they have good habits? Uh, these are things that you can find out, you know, not only from, you know, their, their teachers, their coaches. Uh, you can obviously follow them on, uh, on social media and find out, again, what they're, what they're all about. Um, a lot of times, you know, I worry about the, the locked accounts. I mean, because if we're going to go out and invest in players and, you know, we don't, whether it's university, you know, prep, uh, recruiting is a big part. We can't afford to, to make a mistake. You know, we only have, you know, 12, 14 players um, and we only have that year. So if all of a sudden we, you know, we, we make a mistake, it might, it might cost us uh, uh, immensely that not only did it cost us on bringing that player in, but we might have missed another, you know, high character, you know, no maintenance student athlete. Now, I do have a one donkey rule, so stay with me. You can recruit one donkey and get one donkey, but if you get two, they breed. And that's the issue that you're going to have is that you don't, you don't want two, three, four donkeys. And you can have characters and, and have the one, but he better be talented. He better go get you, you know, 25 points or 20 boards or, or do some really special things. But as I said, um, I got a one donkey rule. I'm only going to have one because, as I said, if you bring two donkeys in, uh, they're going to breed. And that's not great for your championship culture. Um, 
as far as goal oriented, I mean, that's, that's, that goes without saying, and that's goal oriented. Uh, you know, what, what are they striving to do? Um, academics. I mean, you want to make sure that first they, they go to school, you know, that they work hard. I don't Jen, like, I, I don't have a, a standard where, you know, someone has to have an 80% average. I just want someone who, again, goes to school, isn't a problem in the class, will try his hardest and, and do what he can to, 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 to go as far as he can and do his best that he can. On the athletic side, of course, you want somebody, you know, who wants to win, who wants to go to the NBA, go play NCAA or U sports. You want someone who's, who, who definitely has, you know, is motivated and, 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 and is definitely goal oriented. Uh, if not, um, you know, you're probably not going to have a, a real successful year if you have, you know, people who don't have goals. Uh, over the course of my time as a coach, and I've seen it numbers and numbers of time is you know there's a lot of there's a lot of players who really really like the game but when you get to this level because of the demands because really it comes down to prep is you're it's school and ball and that's it so you really have to love the game you can't just kind of really like it and you know i know a lot of players that you know play it because well they're tall they're good at it but there's a difference, and I think you see it in, in the attitudes, and you want, you know, 14, 15 players who love basketball, love the game, and it's their life. If you just like it, um, and, and again, that can, that can breed some other stuff that it's just different. So you need to have a passion for the game. Have, match the same passion as you, that, that I have or my coaching and training staff have for the game. If you can't match that, it's going to be a long season for you. Uh, forget about Xbox. Forget about girlfriends. Uh, forget about hanging out at the mall. Uh, you really have to love the game. And especially, you know, if you want to go to prep school, um, the schedule is crazy. You know, 8 to 3 o'clock, yeah, it's, it's school. 3 to 4.15, study hall. 4.15 to 5.30, it's weights, cardio, ball handling. 5.30 to 7.30, it's practice. So and then you go home, your homework better be done. And as I said, you better love, you know, better love the game. This champions one, I think this is an important one for us and, and me specifically as well is I want to recruit champions. I want to, I want to recruit kids who have won before, kids who have played in big games, kids who don't want to shy away from the moment. And I think people that are champions, they know what it takes to be champions, whether they know their role, they know, again, what it takes. So a lot of the guys that I pre-qualify and screen are champions. And, you know, a lot of our guys that have played for us have come from winning programs. And like I said, the high school programs, they do an amazing job, the club, the AAU. There's a lot of kids that just they want to win. And they know what it takes to, again, be a champion. Those are the kids that, you know, I kind of, you know, look for. And it's a, it's a kind of a qualification for me uh, that, you know, you, you, you've been a champion and you love the feeling of being a champion. You can't stand losing. <laughs> and that's, that's an important characteristic when it comes to kind of recruiting for your culture. Want a championship culture? Go get champions. Of course, there's the coachable um, attitude side. Does he or she want to get better? Um, are they going to be, you know, coachable? Is it, is it kind of, again, the, the, the we over me mentality as far as, you know, putting the team's goals ahead of theirs? And that's what we need to do as far as, again, you know, making sure that they want to get better. Uh, they want to get their teammates better. But having that, you know, coachability, I think, is, is, is definitely important because if you're getting the eye rolls, uh, the poor body language, it's just, again, it will facilitate itself. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not good for any environment and especially there. So trying to find that coachable player is really important. Um, the competitive and toughness, the, the, the physical and mental, uh, both parts, uh, you know, a desire to be the best. I talked about, you know, my, the thing that drives me, I, I love winning, you know, it's great. But I think the thing that fuels me is I really can't stand losing. Uh, you know, I can't stand, you know, tell me I can't do something. Tell me, you know, and, and the losing part, 
I, I just, that, that drives me nuts. So as far as that competitiveness, that fuel to win, the fuel to just get better, and then that mental toughness. So again, just the desire to be your best, you know, that, you know, get, do you get after it? Are you that alpha? Uh, do you, you know, do you do those intangibles? Do you, you know, defensively, do you bully screen? Do you like getting, you know, do you like taking a charge? Um, you know, as far as, you know, we've all had that, you know, that guy, like that Dennis Rodman guy who just does whatever it takes to win and is not going to shy away from the physical toughness. And on the mental side, you, you need people that have, again, played in big games and aren't going to shy away. They want the ball in their hands, not necessarily to score, but to make a play at the end of the game. That's, a, that's the physical and the mental side of, you know, of, 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 a, of, an, of a recruit. And I think that's a real important uh, component when looking for someone to, uh, to again, fill out your roster. Um, I look at, again, off the court as well. I look at certain things that uh, these young men or, again, some, some of your cases, young ladies are doing off the court in the volunteerism. And are they giving? You know, are they going out and doing some things in the community? Um, I know if they aren't, um, I'm going to make sure they do <laughs> when they get to us. So whether they're going to volunteer at a mission, whether they're going to volunteer, I run a Kaleidoscope of Hope charity gala for teen mental health and suicide prevention. They're going to volunteer, whether it's referee for, you know, elementary schools, whether it's to, you know, give clinics, because at the end of the day, you know, our CTA athletes and these prep athletes, these university athletes are role models. And I think it's important and it's a responsibility for them to get out in the community and give back and show, you know, show, give hope to, to some other young and aspiring basketball players that, uh, you know, if you work hard and you do these certain things that you one day can play for CTA or another prep or D1 or U sports. So I think, again, this whole volunteerism speaks volumes to, you know, the type of athletes and, and people that we want to recruit. Uh, the, the empathy, I mean, that is, uh, that is probably the one, you know, characteristic that I find most important in any human being. And that is just, again, you know, putting yourself in other people's shoes, uh, understanding other people's feelings. Um, you know, then, then you get into that whole, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. Uh, don't bully, you know, are you a bully? I think if you're an empathetic person, I think that's someone that, that I like to try to recruit. And that again, goes from the executive management, goes to you know, head coaching, coaching staff, training staff, uh, anybody that you deal with. Uh, I like to make sure that uh, there's a sense of empathy. And uh, if they don't bring it with them, we're gonna try and draw it out of them and, and, and try to figure out how we can make them more empathetic. But I think that's a, a real important human characteristic uh, in, a, in, again, a quality that I'm looking for when I'm recruiting anything in, in my organization. And then it's leadership. It's great that, uh, again, you know, we're going to, as a, as, a, as a management, as a coaching staff and training staff, you know, it's great that we're going to, you know, kind of lead by example. But at the end of the day, if you can't create, generate, uh, cultivate internal leaders within your organization, and these are the players that have to buy in. Um, my best teams, the ones that have been the most successful, have had, and they don't have to be captains. They just, again, usually they are. Uh, we usually have, you know, meetings and, and, you know, weekly meetings with captains just to flush out how the week's been, kind of hopefully keep our finger on the pulse of, of our team. But I use a great example. I coach Sacred Heart um, with uh, Sean Stokwa and Vic Gill. And it's a great example. I always kind of tell, tell coaches this story. Uh, we were a very, very strong team in Ottawa. We ended up winning a city championship, Quad A, went to Quad A OFSA. Um, so we were winning multiple, you know, tournament championships, really solid team. But we were struggling one game. And at the half, um, the team went into the dressing room. I walked with my two assistant coaches and we walked and the closer I got to the dressing room I heard some yelling so I kind of I held off my coaches I put my ear up to the to the room and here's Sean and Vic Gill giving the team a blast so yes 
I could have gone in there, uh, kicked the lockers, thrown some things, cursed, all that stuff, which I you know, usually could do, but it was already done by the team. So that's a great example of, you, you know, your team and your, you know, your, your, your roster is holding themselves accountable and coming from a, from a teammate, it's probably just, it's probably more powerful because as coaches, we're going to go in there and yell and scream and do that thing. But at the end of the day, they're going to kind of, you know, it's going to wear off. You know, they're, you're going to lose the room a bit. Uh, they're going to give you the whole, you know, I see your lips moving coach, but you know, here he goes again. But if it comes from within, and as I said, Sean and Vic, um, you know, that was, that was an amazing, you know, thing that, that I kind of observed. And that's what you want as a coach is that, you know, all the stuff that you're trying to cultivate into your roster has to, has to, has to, again, resonate with, with all your players. But I think if you have an internal leadership, two or three guys that really, really get it, it helps if you're their, your best player, they're goal oriented and all that. It just it just makes our job as coaches a hell of a lot easier if you can develop that internal leadership. So once we have the players and we've developed our roster, I talked about all the things that are important really need to be written down. If you look at everything that's that is important in your life, whether it's a mortgage, a contract, you know, anything that that needs, you know, that needs, you know, a record of and be signed off. I really love to hold, I hold, I hold myself accountable, but I also hold my players accountable. So we talk about rules and expectations. And we talked about again the sign off of a contract and abiding by the contract. I call it more, you know, rules, but more standards and 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 types the the, the types of behavior that we wanna we wanna make sure that, uh, that 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 happen in a championship culture. So I'm not gonna go through all these, but I want you to understand that you know there is a contract that these these players. They know when they sign up to CTA is this is what the deal is. There's no surprises that if you know if you you, you miss if you miss class, you you know things are going to happen. There's going to be you know potential probations. There's going to be suspensions. There's going to be expulsions. There's going to be you know ramifications for everything that you do, good, bad, and ugly. So I think it's important that you know you create that kind of environment or culture that at least it's out there they they know it's communicated it's they've signed off on it and they know that that this is what you're going to be held to so i think as i said anything that's important i really believe has to be captured in in writing and so this is kind of our cta contract obviously again uh, these are kind of our terms and conditions um, that we kind of don't sway from and I talked about, you know, setting the, the, you know, treating everybody fairly. Well, this is about the fairly. Um, not everybody's, the, you know, not everybody's the same, you know, and as, as far as treating them the same, but this contract is the template. And it's kind of, again, the foundation of what we expect from our players. Obviously, this will be uploaded to, to my presentation, and it's also, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's kind of shared on our website as well. There are no surprises, but you need to have expectations. You need to have high standards, and that's, that's why I think you can have success and, and pursue championships, just based on everybody being on that same page and keeping your core foundation, um, all, the, all the stuff that is important to you, in writing, signed off on. So that's the contract. The other thing we do as a player is I think it's important to, to set goals. I think it's very important. Um, these are, you know, again, the old adage goals that aren't written down are just wishes. So I make my players 
talk about their goals and set them. So these are the four simple questions. My goal is for Canada Top Flight Academy. So always team first. What are your goals? If it's not, you know, again, you know, win a championship, go undefeated, all that great stuff. Sure, that's all fluff, but that better be in there. <laughs> uh, how can I help the team achieve these goals? So again, the personal, um, be accountable. Uh, my own personal goals, like, yeah, do I want to make, uh, you know, the all MPA? Do I want to make the bile steel game? Do I want to, you know, win defensive player of the year? You know, all those are important and they need to be captured. What do I need to work on to become a better player? Um, these are all important things that, 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 that are written down. I hold them. And if people sway off them, I get to, you know, we meet, you know, once or twice, three times a year, we sit down and, and how are these goals? goals working out? Are you working towards them? Are you doing everything you can to help us win a championship, to be a better player, to be a better person? Obviously, there's distractions to culture. Um, ego is one of them. And that comes from, you know, again, management, coaches, players. I think the language and communication is, is, uh, is, is, is really helpful. Most of our language and communications that I use, it's all about, you know, whether it's in meetings or in emails, I, I want to use we, us, ours over me, I, and mine. You know, it's, it's their team, our team. You know, these are all the things that, you know, that, that ego can destroy if, if everybody's, again, thinking team. But, you know, if the ego can, can definitely destroy a championship culture. Uh, the balance of respect and appreciation. So it's basically simple. I, I, I love and it's a privilege to have you play in, at, at CTA. But don't forget, it's also a privilege to be at CTA and play for me and our staff. So you have to have that balance. If there isn't, there's that sense of entitlement. Obviously, social media. Are the players and even the coaches, are you playing and coaching for followers and likes and, and highlights? Or are you playing for the good of the team? And as I said, like, you know, that, that can also be definitely a distraction. Uh, smartphones. Um, this is one of the things where, you know, I mean, kids aren't communicating with each other. The way they communicate is with their smartphones. Um, I like to, to take smartphones away and have just team time where it's just go talk to your teammates. You know, um, this, this smartphone, it, it's really restricting communication and it's really, it's dominating a lot of cultures to the point where they don't know how to interact with teammates, coaches, any, any, anybody. And uh, so smartphones is, are definitely a distraction to culture. Um, rankings, yeah, there's a, there's a place, and I don't want to you know, uh, demean what, who's doing the scouting and all that stuff. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it. I think that, you know, again, if you use it constructively, I think it's great. But I think based on, again, some, some players, some teams, they just look at rankings, and it can destroy a, a, a culture. But for me, constructively, I look at it and go, hey, if, if you're number one, well, you better work hard to stay number one. And if you feel that you're underranked, you better work your butt off to, to, to get higher ranked. So it's got to be constructive. Uh, player self-awareness, I mean, that's obviously important is we have a lot of players that, you know, listen from different angles that, you know, a lot of good players you know, a lot of decent players think they're good. A lot of good players think they're great. And a lot of the great players think they're phenoms. And I think, you know, social media, a lot of things feed that. But I think if players actually are self-aware and know how good they are or how bad they are, I think that, that you know, can work again both ways. But it can be a distraction to culture because if everybody is not really self-aware or doesn't have a real grip on things, it's tough. There's the handlers and visors. They obviously have an agenda. Their agenda is for their player. Um, and it's not a team thing. And it's, it's a tough one when, you know, that can be a toxic sort of a relationship where the handler and the advisor is telling the, 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 the player that it's just, uh, you know, different things than, than what the team is trying to accomplish. Um, parents, that's another one. Um, in, in the course of my 30 plus years, I've been blessed with great parents. I've never, I've yet to hear, you know, or, or dealt with, you know, bad parents, parents who, you know, are yelling midstream, shoot the ball, don't shoot, pass, you know, do all that stuff. And of course, there's always that car coach ride home that destroys kids, that, that turns kids off. Uh, just, just 
you know, just enjoy watching your kid play. Uh, obviously, yes, uh, you know, it's important that they succeed, but, you know, watch them play and just enjoy it. Uh, the haters and background noise, we're in a competitive environment. Uh, there's lots going on. Um, you know, there's people that just, again, are going to try. And these could be same people in your trust and your circle of trust, where it's, you know, they're just saying things that, you know, making things up. Uh, it's very toxic. They're questioning. They're trying to, you know, you're trying to construct a culture where they're trying to disrupt a culture. And, you know, a lot of times it's, it could be, you know, within your own organization, but generally it's one of those things where, you know, you just got to make sure that you take care of your business and, you know, there'll always be that grass is always greener uh, mentality. But if you just take care of your business, you know, ho hopefully good things will happen. And then I talked a little bit about compromise standards. Uh, you got a, you, you got your best player. Uh, you got your, you know, your bench player. If Johnny, the best player, misses or you know misses class, um, you know you gotta you gotta discipline him the same as John Jimmy, the bench player. I think it has more impact, and obviously it sends a real message to to your team. Uh, Quickly, last dance, uh, pretty, pretty wild, I must say, because if you go back, it's not really going with what we had talked about as far as the ultimate culture, NBA champs. Was it a great culture? Well, your best player, call him a fierce competitor or a bully. Ask his teammates. You know, he got into fights with his teammates. Uh, you know, he was basically a bully. The second best player on the team resented the organization. Um, and then the overall lack of respect for management, poor Jerry Krause, you know. Um, and then, of course, the donkey who was a distraction. As I said, I'll put up with Dennis Rodman. I'll put up with his 20 boards and what he does. Um, the key to all this was Phil Jackson, perfect architect. Managed egos, was in this together, um, you know, us against the world. He created the narrative. It's over. You know, this is the last, you know, it's our swan song. Let's over. Let's make the most of it. So it worked for them. But I think, you know, you can create your own narrative. For me at CTA, two main narratives. And I may tweak it from year to year, but one is I'm an underdog, the underdog mentality. I'm a disrespected prep from little old Ottawa. So, you know, I mean, we've got, you know, some great prep programs all over the North America, the country, you know, Toronto specifically. I look at us as this little, you know, little place from Ottawa that just always gets disrespected. Even when we win, it doesn't matter. It's just little old Ottawa prep. So I always rally people in my teams around that. We're just little old Ottawa. And then, of course, you know, being the favorite, yes, we've won. So now it's that everybody wants what you have mentality, and you get everybody's best shot. So you better be ready. And as a coach, I love that. I know I'm going to get every best coach's best shot, the team's best shot, because they want to knock you off the perch. So that's kind of the, the last dance. And, you know, you create your own narrative. The last thing, winning is fun, sure, but winning is not the point. Wanting to win is the point. Not giving up is the point. Never letting up is the point. Never being satisfied with what you've done is the point. And, you know, been at this a long time. I want to have fun. Yes, I spell fun W-I-N, but, I mean, I want to enjoy myself. I'm 56 years old. I'm getting old. Uh, I want to enjoy what I do. Um, the kids keep me young. Um, I love what I do. I love doing it with who I'm doing it with. And the, the day that, that the day comes when I don't enjoy that, the culture will suffer, and I will just walk away from it. Some coach, man, I appreciate it. Appreciate not only uh, the time that you've taken for us, but uh, to give us an inside look into what C CTA is and, and how you go about your business. So uh, we got time for one uh, question for you. And then I, I'm wondering first, though, how can coaches connect with you if, uh, if they want to learn more? Well, that's uh, all I do. That's how we can do it. Perfect. <laughs> that? Easy, so, easy. That's great. Yeah, And I'd love to hear from anybody.